Welcome to Gold Derby's reality nonfiction Emmy panel. I am senior editor Marcus James Dixon, and we are here with Chad Mum, the producer of Full Swing on Netflix. Chad, this series takes us behind the scenes of the PGA Tour through the eyes of many of today's most celebrated golfers. Uh, first off, how did you go about trying to make sure it didn't just appeal to golf fans, but instead to the broader television audience at large? Yeah, you know what, what's so fun about golf is that most non-hardcore golf fans have this like mental image about what pro golf is like. And I think it's probably like a deserved image. Uh, and we knew from the very beginning with this series that, you know, because people were bringing so much expectation to this, that it was going to look a certain way, we had a chance to kind of subvert those expectations right out of the gate. And like anything, when you get inside someone else's world, like in this case, professional golf, you pull back the curtain a little bit. It's never what you expect. It doesn't look anything like what you expect. And what we found when we got out there with these professional golfers and these amazing athletes was just how normal their life was, you know, and, and yes, they're flying around on private jets and, you know, hitting shots for millions of dollars, but they also have golf is such a lonely and mental sport that the way they have to blow off steam, the support networks they build around each other, it, it just was so relatable, even though what they were doing on the golf course was completely unrelatable. The stakes were so high. Mm -hmm. Once we got to know the personalities and the characters and, and not just to the players, but their spouses, their friends, their caddies, it just created this like almost ecosystem that felt really recognizable. And, and it was really exciting and fun to kind of push into it. And we always, for anything like this, you know, we want the, the sport, we want the golf to be the payoff of the character story. And so that was always the approach was how do we, how do we hook you in with these characters? How do we make you fall in love with these players? Mm -hmm. How do we make you empathize with them and understand where they're coming from? And when you see those golf shots, whether or not you're a golf fan or not, you know what's at stake for the character. And I think we did a really good job with that. Mm -hmm. And after so many months, if not years of planning and filming and production, the show premiered all eight episodes on February 15th. What was it like to finally see Full Swing on your own Netflix queue? Oh my God, it was such a great feeling. This project's been a real labor of love for me. It's you know been in the works for close to a decade and, and wow. you know, working on getting the access from the PGA Tour and then getting the buy-in from all the other governing bodies in golf. It's not just the tour, there's all the majors and then each player you had to kind of get convinced like and build those relationships and build that trust and you know and then we're out there filming it for a year and and so many amazing things happen you know there's there's so much drama inherent mm -hmm. golf but also the macro story with the rise of like a insurgent league that happened in the middle of the year and we just kept looking around saying like i can't believe this is happening in the years that we have like the year that we get our cameras rolling and then we go into our long post-production process and the stories just start to come to life and you know, we, we knew we had something special, but to see it like in your own living room, you know, mm -hmm. up there on that screen with that key art, it's just, it's the best feeling, especially when you work so hard for something for so long and have it actually pay off, have people like it and watch it. Mm -hmm. It's the best feeling. And you mentioned uh, the PGA Tour. How did you get them to be, to agree to let you film the tournament and, and so many of the players' lives? Was it an easy sell or, or did it take some convincing? It was, a, it was a war of attrition, I think. No, it's, it was all about trust. And I first started pitching them on this idea in 2012. So just to see how long this took. Wow. And, and, you know, they, they said, Hey, we'd love to do something like that. We're just not ready. And then every year I'd see them uh, at, in, in Las Vegas for the consumer electronics show it just happened to overlap every year. And, and I'd pitch them again. And sometimes we'd play golf and I'd say, wouldn't this be amazing to put this on camera? And it was always like, yeah, we're maybe, but not right now. And I think that there was worry that like, golfers cussing would somehow ruin this like gentleman's game image that they had. And then in 2019, the PGA tour got a new commissioner, Jay Monahan, you know, took charge and I saw him again at CES and I went out and played golf with some of the execs from the tour. And I said, Hey, you know what I'm going to ask? I think it's time. And they said, I think it's time. And by the end of that round of golf, we had worked out what the deal would look like, how we would get the rights, how we would approach the players. And then three months later, I'm at Augusta national at the masters without with a general admission pass, basically standing outside the ropes, you know, with a list of players, agents and their pictures of their faces, because you can't have your phone at Augusta. And I'm just meeting people and I'm pitching them on this project. And I said, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna tell your story in an authentic way. And that was always the the deal with the PGA tour. You know, I said, look, if we do this, it has to be warts and all. You've got to, you, you're not gonna have editorial control. You've got to trust that we, that I as a golf fan and as a professional producer, like we're gonna tell the stories as authentically as possible. 
And we want your players to, to watch it back and say, that's what my year was. You guys. Mm. Can. And, and so it took, you know, a couple of years to build the trust, but the to total credit to the PGA tour, once they said, yes, they were, they were all in and they'd never stood in our way. Mm. Uh, I love a good title and full swing is, is just, it, it immediately pops off the page. Tell us about the significance of that. Why did you decide on that as the title? Uh, you know, the title, it was so hard to name this thing, honestly. And now it's so obvious in hindsight, uh, but our, our uh, senior post producer, Christian Winters came up with that idea. And, you know, I, I don't know how he thought of it. We were going in this long title brainstorm and just bang our heads against the wall. And he said, well, what about full swing? And we're like, oh, right. Yeah, that's, that's what they do. But also like the, the game has shifted and with the rise of live, it was a huge swing in the, in the drama of the tour and what you're playing for, whether it's money or legacy, we're like, that's the title. So we went and called Netflix and we said, how do you think about full swing? And they were like, it's all in short, it's active. And it's to your point, it does jump off the screen. Mm. And once you had all the episodes filmed, what was the discussion about what order to air them in? You start with the frenemies episode between Jordan and Justin, and you end with the uh, the Rory episode. Everything has led to this. You know, how did you decide where to start, where, what to be in the middle, what to be at the end? You know, we we our original plan was to kind of go roughly and follow the kind of calendar of the year. But then as we got into the series, we realized that it was going to be more character driven. Like episodes were going to be built around characters or duos of characters, and and we would mm -hmm. pair people together, and it would be more story driven. And so we when we sort of freed ourselves of the notion that we had to follow a linear timeline throughout the season, and we knew we could just jump around a little bit. We could start later. We could circle back to tournaments and different episodes, and just build almost like this ecosystem. When you see an event like the PGA Championship in Tulsa, uh, that that comes up three or four times in that throughout the series, and you kind of keep coming back and landing there. Uh, and, and we chose Justin and Jordan, the frenemies episode, because it just felt like a great way into this world. You know, it's you don't expect pro athletes to be best friends and also rivals. And they're two of the most famous golfers in the world. They're young. They're cool. They've got amazing sort of personal stories and, and just the, the, the stakes for JT to kind of come and, and take his place kind of at Jordan's side as a, as a multiple major champion and what he went through and with his dad and the support he had getting that like historic comeback at Southern Hills. It just, it felt like a, an amazing way to kind of introduce you to the world, throw you right in the mix. We get a major champion right in the first episode and just felt mm -hmm. like it set the tone for the series going forward. Um, once after it aired on Netflix, what were some of the rea reactions you heard from the participants? I imagine most of them were probably pleased with how they came off, but were some, you know, mixed on, on their representation? I think everybody was excited to see golf presented like in a way that made it cool. And mm -hmm. because they've dedicated their lives to this, you know, this is, this is everything for them. And, you know, and they, they're used to hearing from like hardcore golf fans. And they were getting people who've never seen golf before, who started following them. They're commenting on their social media. Like it felt like this warm embrace of like our sport has been validated, you know, like this is everything to us, but now people get to see what we get to do and how kind of crazy and cool this lifestyle is and, and how hard it is to win. So I think everybody, you know, some, we definitely heard some people who were, you know, a little like a little miffed at how sort of they were portrayed, but Overall, I think everybody felt like we we did it honestly. Like it was mm -hmm. what their year was like. The hard decisions they made, some whether it was a good idea or a bad idea or something that was controversial, like we just portrayed it as it was. And we we told everybody we we don't want to. We're not producing this series. It's not the Kardashians. We want to be fly on the wall, and we want life to happen. We want to capture those scenes in verite, and and we'll be there to kind of shape the story as it comes together, but it should be authentic to what actually happened and what happened to you. So everybody, you know, I think felt like we, we absolutely, you know, did, did justice mm -hmm. to their, to their truth for the year. Um, what was coolest for me is hearing from so many people who, who aren't golf fans who said, you know, look, I watched this with my spouse and, you know, my kids and like, they never cared about golf before, but now they're watching golf. And I've been a golfer my whole life, you know, golf's, golf's given me so much and to be able to give back to the game in some way, you know, and, and introduce it to a whole new audience uh, in such an impactful platform as Netflix with this series, it just, it means so much to me. Hmm. And final question, is there any word on a potential second season? I know fans are, are clamoring for it. We are in the middle of season two right now. Yeah. So we started filming at the beginning of the year and, and we've got the second major of the year next week uh, at the and uh, or, sorry, the PGA Championship we're filming. And we've got a lot of the cast that you love from season one will be back and a couple of new ones. So 
much uh, uh, many surprises in store for season two and we're, it's gonna be bigger and better than ever awesome thanks so much for chatting with us today chad of course thank you great questions Welcome to Gold Derby's Reality Nonfiction Emmy panel. I am senior editor Marcus James Dixon, and we are here with Michael Williams, the producer of Gentle Art of Swedish Death Cleaning on Peacock. This uh, show is based on the international best-selling book of the same name. And I'm curious, Michael, how did it come about that it would be adapted into a docuseries on Peacock? Someone uh, about three years ago sent us the book. Mm-hmm. And we read it. You know, it's one of these books you can read in an hour, an hour and a half, and thought it was sort of right up our alley, being uh, producers of Queer Eye for many years, uh, thought we'd be attracted to it, and immediately we read it and said, we have to do this. And in the process of developing it and getting ready to pitch it out, I I actually started doing the process of death cleaning, which is basically going through all the stuff you have, and your all your crap and everything you have, so one day you don't pass it on to your kids or to your family, you're stuck with it. So even since for three years, that's a long, slow process. In our show, we do it much quicker, but we never cover the whole thing. But it's a process people could, in in Sweden, they talk about death and they, a lot of people don't have storage units in Sweden. It's like, they found it amazing. All the people, our heroes that we did had storage units. And they're like, why do you have storage units? And we're like, oh, for stuff we have. What for? So it's that process that we hope catches on, that people start doing this in their lives, empty out storage unit people will probably be very unhappy with our show. But uh, (laughs) the decluttering businesses will probably be very happy with it. But it's a fun process. And uh, we got the the IP, went out and uh, pitched it to Peacock. And they said, let's do it. Let's cast. Um, We wanted a real swedish cast so we i had our casting team just dig into sweden and when oh, in the casting process we were kind of disappointed with the numbers of people we got because and then we were finally real we realized someone someone who worked our showrunner at the time uh said you realize the entire population of sweden is less than la county mm-hmm. and and then a lot of them Swedes are unlike in certainly LA County or in America. You say, hey, do you want to be on a host a TV show? There, they didn't want to have anything to do with it. So it, it was hard, but we got a terrific, terrific cast. We I think we flew in about 10 to 12 people from Sweden to LA mm. to do our little casting session for a couple of days and mix and matching and came out with this really terrific team um uh, we have an organizer a designer and a psychologist and they all work really well together and they're terrific characters Hmm. i watched watching the show i i look around at my own apartment and i'm like well i could get rid of that i don't need that like if i were to die tomorrow i want to clean this out for my family so they don't have to did you kind of feel the same way like did it make you look at your own stuff oh i've been doing it i in fact i did it for our office I went to our office storage unit, which, of course, as you know, with storage units, they just keep up the price over the years. And you just, oh, I'll deal with it one day. I moved all of it into an empty, because of COVID, our office sort of emptied out. We love all of those people, as we all know, work at home these days. So we had this big bank, and I just brought all the storage. And once a week, I'll spend an hour or two with my assistant, because unfortunately, I have to go through it. It's a lot of corporate stuff that personal memorabilia um and go through it once a week for a couple hours just so one day you don't have you know do my daughters want all the press reviews of the fog of war it, you know or the original queer eye uh, from bravo day so they want all that that stuff yeah it's fun to look at it when i go through it but it's like really i'm gonna pass this on so Amy Poehler is a producer on the show, and she also does the narration And her dialogue is so funny. She's basically a character on the show that we just don't see. She's off off camera. Was she always on board to be the narrator or did that decision come later? Pretty no, pretty early on. We went before we were pitching out, we were, um, you know, talking about just the title alone, because obviously the title is, has death in it and Americans don't really like to talk about death and was sort of off-putting. 
and our agent suggested um you know getting a comedic tone to it and they also represented amy and then strangely enough our her her child and my kids are in the same class at school together and one of the moms introduced us uh through school so uh, then we got together she loved it and she agreed she her brother uh who lives in sweden who's lived in sweden for many many years um uh, and she's been there many times she, she just knew the swedish sensibility they're a little you know more reserved and she liked that and so her narration she thought it would go into just make things a little lighter and funny and then you know question the swedish sensibility versus the american sensibility so it, it melded perfectly together i think i think it really needed it and it's make makes it fun ella is the organizer yuan the designer and kat the psychologist they're so full of warmth and kindness and they also have this little naughty edge which i love about them um can you talk about what they bring to the show um, well, they bring their expertise for one. There, you just said, uh, Katarina is a psychologist. She's done TED Talks. She does what's it called? Acro yoga. She talked about flying, pe picking people up in yoga and releasing their energies and all that sort of stuff. But she's able to dig in deep with our uh, heroes. Uh, we filmed in Kansas City, uh, Missouri, the Kansas City area, so Kansas as well. Um, and she gets to talk to deep about personal issues. One of our one of our heroes was actually is, had has stage four cancer and didn't have kids and was just didn't want this truck coming and emptying out her place. But also, none of her friends would mention the word cancer to her. And Katerina was able to just bring that out and. In a beautiful scene with her, she talks about, you have stage four cancer. And our hero said, you were the first person besides my doctor who said that to me. Hmm. Her friends, relatives, no one said that. So she's the great psychologist. Ella is this organizer. Get rid of this crap. Keep this. Here's a, um, a personal box, little things that you want to hold on to a scarf that your mother had that brings you flooded memories, keep it in a box, keep it to yourself. And then there's the box that uh, you don't want anybody to find after you die. You know, whether it's uh, in our first episode, Susie has Thumper, a sort of a <laughs> toy. Uh, <laughs> if you, you know, know, you know. <laughs> you know, you know, uh, and get rid of. And Yuan just helps with the design. Not, And it's not a design show. We do have a makeover element. Uh, and very lighter Scandinavian touch. Uh, to me, I, I keep saying it's that's the frosting on the cake of our the makeover on this show are the people because besides decluttering their house, we declutter their hearts and souls. And the little reveal, the reveal is personal. Usually, with cat and the reveal with the, their house to me is secondary i know some people watch it just for that part but to me that's the secondary reveal it's more about this transformation of uh people and their attitude mm -hmm. and how did you find the participants you, you're mentioning them as as heroes how did you find some of these folks in, in kansas city that were we ha we hired a, a casting company that actually amy polar worked on on baking it that went and found real people and mm -hmm. We had meetings with them and liked them, and they're even based in Minneapolis, but they just put their team together and do what, you know, reality casting people do is just get the word out. And the main part is we had eight episodes, and every single story is different. There's just, mm -hmm. I mean, not just, it's, you know, there are empty nesters. One family was, they had eight kids, but all eight kids are grown and moved out, but all their rooms are filled like they were still in high school and the people wanted their house back or mm -hmm. um and someone whose wife had died and uh and had this collection of stuff his new fiance wouldn't move in until he cleared out all his stuff so we had great it's a great variety of eight different stories and each episode has this little intermission called a fika a coffee break uh where did this idea come from it's so fun it kind of 
takes you out of the main story and just you you're just spending time with these three uh, Swedish death cleaners. Well, when we were doing the research on it, we um, Fika is coffee break in Swedish, basically, but everyone takes it way more seriously than we do uh, uh, in Sweden at around 10 o'clock. You have Fika. You sit for coffee and little snacks and cakes, and it's a big big tradition when we were hearing about it, i think we our um hosts were telling us about it. i said oh we have to include it we have to have fika we have to start doing this uh and it's fun and they get to they they get to talk about what they were doing our hero and we also have them talk in swedish and we have a lot of uh we like throwing in swedish phrases and words and you know we do a little lower third of what they mean and so it makes it makes it a little fun. It makes them more Swedish. <laughs> so I, we just want to reiterate that these people are from Sweden, because in Sweden, which after reading this book, we thought, oh, we just look up death cleaners in Sweden. It's really not a profession. People do it as a practice. Um, it's like spring cleaning here. People there aren't you don't look up spring cleaners, uh, but people do it as generally a practice. So. Mm. Well, it's such a fun show and best of luck at the Emmy Awards coming up, Michael. Thank you for chatting with us today. Thank you, Marcus. Welcome to Gold Derby's Reality Nonfiction Emmy panel. I'm senior editor Marcus James Dixon, and we are here with David Brindley, the producer of The Reluctant Traveler with Eugene Levy on Apple TV+. Plus. Uh, David, this show is entering the hosted nonfiction category at the Emmys, and it's one of the funniest shows currently on television, thanks in no small part to Mr. Eugene Levy, he's totally out of his element as he explores the world. How did you get him to do this project? Uh, it's entirely down to Eugene Levy, actually, that uh, that it's that funny. But um, uh, it's it, it, it's quite a good story about how we how we actually got Eugene to do the show. We were pitching and developing a different show or or a similar show for Apple TV Plus, um, uh, which was about uh, beautiful hotels around the world uh, that had extraordinary views. Um, and uh, we, uh, myself and the commissioner at Apple, um, Alison Kirkham, were both obsessed like the rest of the world with Schitt's Creek at the time that we were um, um, pitching the show. And... Um, uh, and we thought that Eugene would be the absolute perfect person to to host the show. So, um, so we we sent it to Eugene's agent, who politely uh, declined it uh, twice. Uh, and then uh, and and then uh, we said just one more time, we'd really like to get on the phone with Eugene if it was at all possible. Uh, and so we did. Uh, amazingly, Eugene jumped on the call. Um, uh, what we didn't know was Eugene thought he was jumping on the call to tell us yet again that it wasn't right for him very politely very very um uh kindly just to come on camera and say he wasn't going to do the show and then he told us the reason that he couldn't do the show uh, and that was because he really didn't like travel he hated travel uh and uh, there was so much about travel that that irked him <laughs> and that annoyed him and he wasn't well traveled uh at all uh so as he was telling us all of this myself and Alison were uh falling about laughing really on the other side of the the zoom call um uh and after we got off that call and Eugene thought that he'd politely declined the show uh for the third time um uh, both Alison and I said that's the show. Uh, it's a show about somebody, uh, it's a travel show about somebody who doesn't uh, like to travel. And so we we uh, sort of redesigned the pitch. Um, we made it very bespoke to Eugene uh, and we went back to Eugene and pitched him The Reluctant Traveller. Uh, and he really liked that and got that. And he understood the, the the potential comedic value of it, but also that it was really authentic. It was, it was genuinely how he felt about travel. Uh, and, and then we all felt, I think, the three of us, that we had a... Uh, 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 something unique in a travel show, um, uh, which is which is hard to find because there are a lot of brilliant, brilliant travel shows um, uh, out there. But once once we tailored it very specifically to Eugene, um, we felt like uh, we could find a, a, a little gap in the market and have something that felt quite special. I love how in the, in the first episode, he basically opens the show by saying, I'm in the Arctic Circle, but I'm not a winter person. I don't ski. I don't skate. I don't even make snowballs. Um, so how how much did you enjoy putting Eugene in these wild locations just to see how he would react? 
<laughs> well, the brilliant, one of the first Zooms that we had once we decided to do the show uh, uh, and once Apple had commissioned the show, um, we had with Eugene where we just asked him to talk about everything that he, he that he didn't particularly like about travel. And he went through a huge list of he doesn't like the hot, he doesn't like the cold, doesn't like the wet, doesn't really like the desert, doesn't like, uh, you know, um, Michelin star food particularly, is, is, doesn't have an adventurous palate, um, uh, you know, hasn't been to X and Y. And essentially on that call, he had described everything that we needed uh, in terms of thinking about the places that we would want to take him uh, and and the encounters that he would have that he that that inadvertently I suppose he'd given us our uh, entire structure for all of for all of the episodes because then um we were able to sort of choose locations and countries that uh, we gave him a very different experience. Um, I think it's important to say, though, as well, that it's not it's not a churlishness on 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 behalf of uh, Eugene, and neither is it the production sort of just kicking him in the back and making him do these things. He also, at the then at the age of seventy five, could see that there might be a value in broadening his horizons a, a little more, and 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 wanted to see what the world could offer him, and and whether or not you know it might open his mind a little. And so, um, so that's what I like about the the the, the tone of the. Show show I think is uh is that it's not us just forcing him to do loads of things that we know he will hate it's actually him actively you know encountering some of those things and seeing or not seeing whether or not he becomes a, a, tra a transformed man you know uh, by dint of doing some of those things mm. the first episode is set in Finland and that's also the one you're submitting to the Emmy Awards uh what is it about the episode you're most satisfied with just on a production level uh, well, for, it's sort of got a bit of everything, I think, which is why we really liked it. Like, like you very kindly said, uh, I think it's a very funny episode. Eugene's, um, you know, brilliantly comedic uh, in those situations. Uh, but it also shows the range, I think, of of of, um, of, of the production team. Uh, there are sort of, you know, the cinematography is particularly beautiful in that episode. I think, you know, our, our cinematographer, Sam Hardy and Harvey Glenn did an in incredible job. Uh, uh, our series director, James Callum, um, sort of created sequences in that in that episode which are just just they completely and utterly transport you off your couch and 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 make you feel either like you're there or that you desperately want to go there particularly I think the the husky setting um uh scene which is which is really beautiful equally the music in that scene which is by David Schweitzer is is um really beautiful and also Eugene is incredibly game and uh, you know at the end of the episode uh you know um no big spoiler here but he goes he goes ice floating uh uh with uh one of the uh people that he meets um um, uh, in the hotel and he's genuinely transported I think in in the episode and 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 arrived um not loving the cold uh, and left you know slightly warmed by everyone that he'd met in Finland uh, and 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 I think it was a real moment actually particularly on the back of the husky sled he came off and it was genuinely the most fun that he'd had for a long, for a long time I think certainly on vacation um uh, and so it 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 feels like um I think a transformative episode and also it's just an episode I think that was incredibly hard to uh to pull off in the time that we had our line producer um Lily Fitzpatrick and her team did an incredible job just just the logistics of getting that team that crew uh up into the Arctic Circle uh and hopefully making it look relatively easy um it's all is all down to them so I think I think it it provided uh it provided real range I think and hopefully it's a it's a it's an enjoyable watch mm -hmm. Uh, besides Finland, you also traveled to Costa Rica, Venice, Utah, the Maldives, South Africa, Lisbon, and Tokyo throughout season one. Uh, that's basically every nook and cranny of the entire world. How did you decide on those locations? And is there anywhere you wanted to go that maybe you couldn't for any whatever reason? Well, yeah, the big thing was was COVID. So we were making this throughout the pandemic, uh, which is not easy to make a global travel show uh, when half the world is shut down, and, and more than that, actually. Um, so there was a, there was a practical um, uh, element to some of the places that we chose and that we could we could travel to. We were constantly battling um, countries closing and and opening again, and and uh, so that that was definitely part of the of the uh, uh, sort of decision making process. But but. More than that, editorially, we were very sort of 
keen that every single episode felt very distinct almost had its own feel had its own color palette you know had its own tone and so when you looked at those episodes you know on on the apple platform each tile told hopefully tells a story and 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 looks very distinct you know utah looks very orange costa rica looks very green finland looks very white and so hopefully it gives you um real range uh, and we obviously wanted to spread ourselves uh, as far across the the globe as possible and give eugene you know the most uh, varied experience that 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 was possible um and hopefully you know at a time when we weren't able to travel you know as as uh, lay audience members uh hopefully create a series that um allowed some escapism uh for the audience and got you to the four you know the far flung corners of the world uh and hopefully also maybe inspired a few people you know whether you're eugene's age at 75 or whether you're you know 21 to to think uh think uh, you know uh, afresh about uh, about travel and, and what it can offer you do you have a favorite memory from filming in any of the hotels? These are all completely off the grid, mind blowing hotels. I loved the one in Africa that was like a, a, a train car, an abandoned train car up on a bridge. Yeah, I mean, the South Africa episode was pretty extraordinary. That hotel, uh, I think, it, it is one of the one of the most unusual hotels, certainly that that we featured that I've ever seen. Uh, to be suspended above the the African plains, where there are wildlife, uh, you know, walking beneath the, your your train carriage, it was very real, and that was that was the other thing we wanted to put Eugene in in. Uh, situations um, that weren't contrived. You know, we wanted him to sleep in somewhere where, in the middle of the night, he would hear the the sound of wildlife um, uh, right beneath his window. And and you sort of then can't you, you can't avoid the the um, uh, the realities of the places that you're in. Uh, and we and we and we obviously we push that even further. So South Africa, for instance, you know, what I think I think in terms of the episodes and most memorable moments, you know. Um, certainly for me, I think, was when we got Eugene uh, to join a veterinary um, team who were going out to dart an elephant to check on uh, their health. Um, uh, and uh, and Eugene very gamely said that he'd help he'd help those vets do that, not his not his you know natural <laughs> um, uh, role. Uh, uh, and there was a moment when um, uh, one of the vets suggested that uh, the next sample that needed to be taken would be a fecal sample um, from the elephant. Uh, she produces a sort of foot long glove uh, and suggests that Eugene helps out. And it was it was a moment where we we hadn't told Eugene that that was going to happen. <laughs> uh, and uh, he was completely and utterly shocked. You can see in the episode, he says, oh, I, I don't think I can do this. Uh, and and the bit that you don't hear in the episode is that I'm behind camera and I say to him, I, I think you can actually, Eugene. <laughs> and he very, very gallantly and gamely pops the glove on, gives the um, an elephant an internal inspection, uh, one of which he'll never forget. And, uh, and probably the elephant too, actually. And the audience. I don't think I'll ever forget that either. <laughs> well, David, thank you so much for chatting with us. The Reluctant Traveler has been picked up for a season two. Uh, I can't wait to see where you travel to next. Thanks so much. Great talking to you. Welcome to Gold Derby's reality nonfiction Emmy panel. I am senior editor Marcus James Dixon, and we are here with Clay Newbell, the producer of Shark Tank on ABC. Clay, the show marked its 300th episode during this 14th season. There have been over 1,000 pitches in the tank. You've won four Emmy Awards over the years. I'm curious, what do you think is the secret to this show's never-ending success? It's... um. That's a good question. It's it's hard to say. Uh, I don't think there's one reason. I think there's a multitude of reasons. It's uh, but it definitely strikes a chord with people. Um, you know, the obviously you've got the sharks. They're fantastic. We learn from them. Our show is a show that is not only entertaining but it's also educational. That's uh, you know a rare a rarity, particularly I think in the nonfiction space. Um, you know, it's it's fun. It's funny. I'm learning. The sharks are great, but probably you know the heart and soul of the show are the entrepreneurs that come on our show. Um, because I, you know, I, it's funny. You know, who would have thought that entrepreneurs would make great television? Certainly not I. But um, there's something that's so admirable about them that you see when you watch our show, and uh, you know, they have such incredible stories, you know, and they've overcome such great adversity to get to that moment on the on the on the uh, on the rug. And, 
you know, some of them have walked away from high paying jobs because ultimately they weren't weren't happy or satisfied with that job, all to risk it to try and become their own boss. Right. It's um, it's pretty incredible. And I think we see ourselves or who we hope we could be in them because you're sitting at home, you know, and we're watching the show. And here's somebody who comes in and tells this incredible story of how they got here today, all chasing this dream, this idea to give themselves to change their life. I mean, Shark Tank, uh, Shark Tank is sort of the great equalizer, right? Anybody can walk onto our show, uh, regardless of age, gender, socioeconomic, race, uh, or, or educational background. Um, anybody that comes on the show, they stand on that rug. They're, you know, it's a great equalizer. Everyone is given that same opportunity when they pitch the sharks. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. My my son has been, he's in eighth grade, so he's been studying the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, and he was reading it to me, and um, you know, just as it recently. And I, I think our founding fathers would have been fans of Shark Tank. Um, you know, every person has these unalienable. Yeah, I'm going to I mispronounce that, but every person has these rights, mm-hmm. right, to pursue life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And I think that uh, you know that's what we see when we watch those people come. You know, the entrepreneurs they come mm-hmm. on that show, they're pursuing their life, their liberty, their freedom, their pursuit of happiness for them and their family. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, they, they walk away, they just, the courage to come on television and pitch an idea, a dream, and you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if the shark's going to like it. If they're not, you're going to get shredded or you're going to get a deal. And really for the viewers at home, it's, it's inspiring. It's aspirational. These people are in pursuit of the American dream. You know, we call it the American dream because we're in America, but it's really, again, it's a global dream. It's a human dream, right? Every, it doesn't matter what country you're from or who, you know, mm. where you're from. Everybody, you know, has that dream of, I want to do well for myself and my family and potentially have an impact on the world, right? Mm. And on society with, with something that's an idea that I had and, and they get their shot on Shark Tank. And I think that for us, As I said, you know, we see a little bit of that or we hope to see ourselves in them because they have the guts and the courage to do it. And they're not just pitching the sharks. They're pitching all of America. Every all those people at home are going to be judging them at at that moment, too. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think, you know, there's like I said, there's a lot of things that that factor into the show and why it why it resonates. But it certainly does strike a chord. And I think the entrepreneurs, as great as the sharks are, and they are fantastic and they impress you know we're going into our 15th season we'll be we'll, we're going to start taping our 15th season in about a month and they continue to just surprise us every year with amazing information and knowledge but i think it's those entrepreneurs that come in with their dreams and that pursuit of that dream and again that pursuit of their life and liberty and happiness uh, mm-hmm. that makes the show really special so well said um one of the ways you keep things fresh after so many years is you keep adding new guest sharks to the panel. And Gwyneth Paltrow is probably one of the biggest ones you've ever had. Um, how did that decision come about? Is she just a huge fan of the show like all of us are? Well, um, <laughs> yeah, I would first of all, yes, Gwyneth was a, a huge get for us. Um, it wasn't the first, you know, we've gone out to Gwyneth in the past. Um, and this year, I think the stars aligned is, is, you know, it happens sometimes and we were persistent. We, she was somebody that we felt would be a great guest shark because she's so well known as a celebrity for her acting, you know, per, her performances, she, she's an Academy award winner. Um, but the thing that we really liked about her is that while that was going on, she also had this idea to start her own business goop which has just become hugely successful. I think it's like, I don't know, $400 million company right? retail sales or 600 million, something mm-hmm. really huge um, now. And when she was at probably the peak of her acting career, she started Goop, right? And people were telling her, you know, because, and then Goop, as, it's, as it grew, it became more and more successful. It pulled more and more of her time, right? Because she's running this business. It's not, she wasn't just the face of the business. She was the person behind the business, instructing what direction the business is going to go, assembling an incredible team, which she has done. Um, and it took more and more time away from her opportunities to be 
what everyone thought was her career, which was as a performer or as an actor in our entertainment industry. Um, and a lot of there were, you know, I don't I don't want to speak for her, but she said that in, in her shark profile interview, which we did and was, was in her first episode, she mentions the fact that a lot of people thought maybe that's not a good idea because you're doing so well in this area. Why, why would you want to do that and jeopardize? And she, but as I said earlier, and whether it's Gwyneth who pursued this dream and it's become this huge success, and I'm sure there's no regrets for her, our entrepreneurs that come on the show, it's, you know, they want to someday have some success, Mm -hmm. you know, similar to, to Gwyneth. But also, you know, we've, we've had some incredible guest sharks. I would say, you know, La, uh, year before last season 14 we had Gwyneth we had Kevin Hart <laughs> who was incredible and I think the thing that was so great about Kevin was that he's you know he's probably even more recognizable worldwide than Gwyneth mm. Kevin Hart everybody knows Kevin Hart he's such a great actor and comedian but I don't think is where whereas Gwyneth a lot of people knew about Goop and her success and she's formed this incredible company which has gone on to be a real juggernaut a lot of people were surprised, I think, when Kevin came in and he was so business knowledgeable. I mean, he held his own. He was, in a lot of ways, he controlled the room. And I've heard from other people, it's like, well, that's Kevin. He does that wherever he's at. <laughs> it's just who he is. You know, he's just in force of nature. But I think a lot of our viewers um, were surprised that, you know, Kevin wasn't just a performer. He was a businessman. Mm-hmm. And um, a, a good friend of mine, who's a big Kevin Hart fan, reached out to me afterwards. And, hey, I watched the episode, and I, I it, you know, it was great, but I, I thought Kevin was going to be more funny. And I said, "Well, that's Kevin when he's performing, when he's doing stand up, or he's in a comedy." But th- you saw Kevin, the businessman, and yeah, mm-hmm. he was still funny, but he's not looking for jokes. He's approaching this and having a discussion as a business person. And uh, the episode you're submitting to the Emmys this year is the season finale, which will air May 19th on ABC. I've seen it. It's a tearjerker. I'm not going to spoil anything, but the last pitch is a must watch. Um, what is it about this episode that that is the one that you're like, this is the one we have to submit? Well, um, every season, you know, we shoot uh, approximately 150 pitches and or, or 140 depending, uh, you know, actually I'm going to share a quick little story, Marcus, you, you visited our set a few years back, yes. you know, long okay. before COVID and prior to us having this conversation today, you'd share that we saw one pitch and we were a little surprised on how long the pitch took. It, it took like an hour long. Yeah. About an hour. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, uh, the other uh, producers, showrunners that have spoken today have talked about authenticity in their shows. And I, I you know, I, I'm really happy when I hear that um, for any show. And that's certainly certainly um, how we approach Shark Tank. We want it to be authentic. The sharks know nothing about the businesses before they come in, right? And that's by design because it forces the sharks to ask a lot of questions. And that's how we as a viewer at home learn, right? It's now for, for a moment, I'm the fly on the wall watching this business meeting going down. So what happens is uh, we shoot eight to 10 pitches a day and the entrepreneur will walk in and they'll hit the rug and they'll pause for a moment while we get some shots. And then our stage manager says, begin. And they'll go into their pitch. Pitch is going to last a minute and a half, two minutes. Then it's an open-ended Q&A, which can go anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes to, in your case, an hour for that pitch that you saw, depending on the complexity of the business, how many sharks are interested, if it gets into a bidding war, et cetera. Um, And you know, it's really important to us that it be an authentic business meeting. Um, and we take that, the average pitch is 40, 40 to 45 minutes. We edit that down. Um, Yun Lingner, another one of our executive producers and our post team do a great job of heading in down something that long to this long. And it's makes, it, first of all, first, it makes sense still. Mm-hmm. You can track it, but it's dramatic and it's funny. And it's got, you know, it's got highs and lows and peaks and valleys throughout the entire pitch. So. You know, that's it, it's this authentic moment. Whatever happens, happens out there. We don't stop the cameras. We don't say, OK, we're going to can you say that again? There's none of that. Um, we don't stop rolling the cameras until the entrepreneur has left the room. We give a few minutes for the sharks to talk about what just happened. And then we'll say cut. And then we set for the next one. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's that's our process. Now, while we're shooting all of those pitches, 
we we want our premiere to be great and we want our finale also it's probably our second most important show of the season so we'll earmark some episodes that we want to save for that finale uh, or some episodes sorry some pitches and as you said um i think our if you look at our at the four pitches that we have in our finale it's a good range you've got representation of different types of entrepreneurs people different types of businesses how far along they are and they each have their own different story and, and you know that's that's when i say earlier when you asked what's the most important element that i think the entrepreneurs are mm-hmm. because each one of them walks in with their own unique story they're they're their own little show their own little movie their own little tv segment each entrepreneur that comes in because regard you know this the businesses may have some similarities but that how they got there is going to be different and the person behind that is going to be different so we targeted um influencers in the wild which is a uh a, a social media influencer named tank who's very popular mm-hmm. um has a great uh great social media platform and he has created a board game uh about s- social media influencers which is really funny and fun and uh i thought that you know that that's a, a great pitch i'm sure everybody has seen social media influencers out there or somebody you know taking their photos of themselves and it it sort of has fun with that um tones of melanin is is a story of um a female entrepreneur african american who has she's a great example of someone that has courage and grit and started a business that she saw you know just on her own when she was in college that she could do and has grown it into a very successful business uh tucky is a great example of a stay-at-home mom who had a need for a garment and just created and invented something on her own and then the one that you mentioned the the final pitch mm-hmm. which is the tearjerker and yeah it's it it certainly is um is I, iris and it's a father son team that come in with a really smart idea for eyewear um so it it it's uh it's a great episode. And I think, you know, really, and we also have a seasons update recap, which we do in every finale episode, which basically highlights all the updates that we did through the season, which updates are sort of the, you know, obviously the update on where the companies that we're highlighting are now, and this they're telling their success stories. And it also mm-hmm. highlights the guest sharks that we've had on the show for the season. Well, it's the perfect episode for, you know, Emmy voters to analyze as they vote. Uh, Well, thank you so much, Clay, for chatting with us today and uh, stick around. We're going to do the big panel next. Great. Thank you. Welcome to Gold Derby's reality nonfiction group panel for the 2023 Emmy Awards. We would like to welcome back David Brindley for The Reluctant Traveler, Michael Williams for Gentle Art of Swedish Death Cleaning, Chad Mum for Full Swing, and Clay Newbill for Shark Tank. Uh, For this first roundtable question, I'd love to know why you think unscripted and reality TV connects with viewers at home so much. The genre is so incredibly popular and it's only getting bigger and bigger, you know, through the years. Uh, Chad, I'll start with you for this one. Yeah, you know, I think if we'd uh, turned in a script for the season of Full Swing that we got, uh, the real life script, it would have been thrown back in our face for being too unrealistic. And, you know, it's a trope that real life is stranger than fiction, but you know, we just lived it for an entire year and our cameras captured everything. And I think that that's what makes unscripted documentaries and reality interesting is you get, you know, sometimes real life really is more interesting and more exciting and, and kind of crazier than you could ever dream up. And Clay? Yeah, I, I was going to say the same thing. I, uh, years ago, I worked for Beanham and Murray. Uh, I just, uh, did the second and third season of Real World, and then helped create and produce and directed uh, Road Rules for several years for MTV, for Buna and Murray. And I remember a particular moment, you know, to uh, that we were driving in the Winnebago, it was nighttime, and late at night, and we were on our way to some, I don't, I can't remember where we were going, but we, there was a thump on the windshield. And uh, Carlos Los was driving and he's like, what's that? And he turned on the windshield wipers and the windshield wipers start going back and forth. And he goes, it's a bat, man. <laughs> right. And he was right. It was a bat had smacked into our windshield and we pulled over because he couldn't get it off. The bat, unfortunately, had 
perished in the impact. But the cast comes out and just on their own at that very moment decides that they're going to bury this bat. So they, they get some gloves, they take the bat out, they dig on the side of the road. We're out in the middle of nowhere, probably a desert or something. They dig on the side of the road, they bury the bat, they say a few words, they get back into the Winnebago and we keep on going. And myself and my, my uh, ca uh, camera operator at the time, we turn to each other afterwards and like, you know, you just, that stuff, you would never write that, right? It would never happen. You would never believe that that just happened and what the reaction was and what was said afterwards and the barrier, the whole thing. And it's just at that moment, it's, it just really hit that, that life is, is real life is better than anything you can write, I think. In, in many, many, uh, in many, many cases. And I think that's why people, you know, when it's authentic and when it's real, it just connects with people. And how about you, Michael? Uh, with, with our show, it's, it's so relatable. Everyone has a story. Anyone over the past year that I've told what I'm working on, oh, I could have used you last year. You know, so-and-so passed away or oh, I've been uh, cleaning out my grandparents' stuff for years or my garage unit my garage is full everyone has that story and even in when the show just premiered two weeks ago but all the comments they're not commenting on the quality of the show everyone was telling their story all the comments were oh when this happened to me i did this and everyone was relating to it so that's why people just relate to it that right and it wakes them up they're, oh my god that happened to me i have to do this it's okay to throw away something Mm. Uh, you know, that's just sitting somewhere collecting dust. But I, I that's what reality is about. The, the fantasy world of watching shows like Shark Tank's one of my favorite shows. I've watched it for years and years and years. And I just like, I had a great idea. I had a great idea for uh, um, kettle, baked, kettle potato chips 25 years ago. And I'm like, why did I follow up with that deal? Where was Shark Tank back then? Um, you know, uh, but anyway, I, you just relate to those people and see how the spark in people's eyes. And of course, this weekend, I'm going to binge watch the Eugene Levy show. I love him and I love travel. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. and my okay. daughter will watch, I'm going to make my daughter, who's also in eighth grade, watch uh, Full Swing. <laughs> uh, David, what about you? Why do you, why do you think reality TV and, and unscripted connects with viewers so much? Uh, yeah, I suppose building a bit on what Michael said there about sort of recognizing yourselves. I think, I think you know, uh, unscripted, it sort of holds a mirror up to us, doesn't it? And we like that, whether that's um, whether that's because it's emotional and uh, or whether that's because it's hilarious or funny or moving or we can all re we can all relate to that person that you're seeing in it, you know, on screen because they're real and uh, and whether or not uh, it's it's interesting with the with the Eugene show, we have a lot of people say. Oh my gosh! Finally, there's someone on screen who who feels the same way about travel that I do. Not like not like all the other travel presenters who are loving every moment of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but equally, there's people who are like, I can't believe. You know, I'm the complete opposite of Eugene. But the fact you have, you know, in in all of these shows, you have you have people on screen who um uh, who who obviously are real. They're talking about real lives, and and you you recognize either a part of yourself, a lot of yourself, or none of yourself in in those people, and so you immediately. Have have a connection i mean i love i love scripted shows and i love uh, you know falling into them and escaping into them and uh, and uh, but they but they do a different job but there's 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 a there's a power in the, the the act of having a camera and putting it in front of someone and have someone tell your story which is really really transformative and really immediate and and can be really intimate and that that's the thing i suppose that we we all get really excited about don't we those moments when you're filming something and someone's telling you something or you're watching a moment happen and and it's authentic and it's really happening and like you've all said it's better than anybody could possibly write mm -hmm. uh, all of your shows do not have scripts so i'm curious how important is the picture editor in, in this process because it, how does the editor have to form the stories and form the character developments you know what would you how would you do it without them basically uh how about you uh, david uh, i think they're completely and utterly integral i mean certainly on our show but also in my experience of un, uh, in, in non-scripted um i think that that's you know structuring those stories uh and and 
um, we we're all about we're all, we're all storytellers, right? So and so so crafting and building a story and finding the right narrative arc and 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 having the right music at the right moment or ha- knowing when to breathe at the right moment and actually have nothing is is an incredible art form. And the and 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 I, I think the difference between a, you know an a, a, you could have the same rushes and the difference between an absolutely stellar you know Emmy award winning show and one that's pretty good. It's often down to that editor, you know, you, who who can just who can just sort of, uh, you know, t- take that material and spin it into something which is, you know, really really hilarious or beautiful or or moving. And and so I, I'd say they're, you know, uh, they're, they're right at the top of the tree of uh, you know of that of that team that are, are creating mm-hmm. the story. Mm-hmm. And you're not in clay. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the um, the story producers. Uh, the editors and, and finding the moments and it's crafting so much of well so much of shark tank is done and what we say is nuance right it, it's the reaction it's the close-up it's the music cue it's the the sound effect you know it's it's building those stories and telling those stories and they're absolutely for for our show and but just not shark tank but all the shows i've ever been involved in when i've in, in reality television it's those story people that do an incredible job. And, and I, I do want to agree with David. I'm not, I am a huge fan of scripted shows and scripted films and stories and books, but I, you know, I think that, uh, and I want to go on record with that, um, particularly now with the strike that's taking place, you know, support these people. I, I'm not, you know, some people have been saying that um, it's, it's good for people in reality. I don't think it's good for anybody, frankly. I don't want to see anybody out of a job particularly not now with, with everything that's been going on in, in our economy, et cetera. Um, and I certainly uh, appreciate their work and I'm a big fan of it and watch it all the time. But I do think that there's something that connects with people about just having an average person that's, that could be me or my neighbor yeah. that, you know, suddenly has this moment on reality television. I think that, I don't think that either form is ever going to go, go away. I think they're, they're always going to complement each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, Michael? No, the editors and story producers make or break a show, especially in a first season. We were doing first season, we're out in the field, we hadn't tried and true, and we started putting it together. And I must admit, it's the editor. I've always found you find editors who aren't just doing it because it's a job. You find the editors who just really love the idea of the show that you're doing. And in the first few episodes, we were in screenings and just laughing and thinking they were great. And then later on, though, we were like, what happened? Oh, oh we switched editors. I'm like, why? And we're, it, it lost all this stuff. So it's just having the producers in and it's hard. And I must have been after, after the end of that season and another show too, it's like, you get what you pay for. Don't try to get cheap at it. <laughs> editors to keep in a, a line in a budget is someone says i get this much money i did another show that we ended up bringing a, a finished editor and that cost a fortune but turn the show around completely hmm. and you know because they were passionate about it and they just wanted to dive in and, and dig mm-hmm. and i've had editors sometimes they're just doing it as a makeover show standard uh but you, this had we had more heart to it and they, they found it so you have you have that number, Michael. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Chad, what about you? Yeah, you know, so for our series, we interview the athletes first without cameras. And the first time we ever, you know, get them in a chair. Because if you've ever been around pro athletes, you put a camera in their face, you put up the lights, they kind of go into media training mode. They're used to having cameras in their faces after a round or, you know, at a press conference. And they just kind of go back to the same couple of talking points. So when we started Full Swing, we sat down with these athletes for the first time. You know, we did them all sort of 20 interviews in like two days and happened to be in the Bahamas because there's a tournament there. It's a lot of r- real rough life traveling for the series. Um, but we brought them into a recording studio and we like told them not to come in golf clothes, put a mic on them and just sat and chatted. And it was like a, almost like a podcast and you could just see them open up as you, you know, they didn't feel the pressure of the cameras in their face. And we wanted to know about sort of who they were and what their goals were, what relationships mattered. It wasn't about their golf round. It wasn't what shot they hit on 17. It was like very refreshing for them, I think, to to actually try to get to the heart of who they were and sort of what mattered to them. 
And, and so we use those audio interviews to basically write out what we thought a, a narrative arc would be for this character. And essentially the act of the show is to like essentially tell that story back to them. Because in most cases, what they were worried about was the thing that impacted them. It was the thing that happened. The, the, the tournaments they were excited about, they ended up winning. Or, you know, if they didn't, they were heartbroken about it. It's just, it became a framework. And then when you think about the role of our editors, you know, we had like story beats written out, you know, as this, and, and it's a long shoot. We shot, you know, 300 days last year on the, on the road and the PGA tour, and, you know, across the world. It's the opposite of how you do most shows where you're thinking about like, trying to minimize the hour shot versus final screen time. And this was like, throw that out the window. It was more about creating memories and then coming back to those in the, in the editing process and tying them together into the story. But so we had these, like, we had this idea for what these narratives would be. We had it kind of plotted out and then to get back and sit through the first edit, and look at the first rough cut and just watch it come to life on the screen, just to see the drama elevated so much by sight, sound and motion and really creative choices. It, it just like blows you away. And I, I'll never forget my, I think my favorite episode is our, is our fifth episode about Matt Fitzpatrick, uh, who wins the US Open. And he's kind of an underdog story. In many ways that episode, you could teach a screenwriting class about the narrative arc of that episode. It's like, it's literally like how you would diagram it, what mm -hmm. he goes through, the setbacks he sees, you know, his, the villain he's up against, or just at least the mountain he has to climb. Uh, and then the payoff in the moment, you know, and the first time we saw he hits, he hits probably one of the best shots in US Open history to win the tournament out of a bunker on the last hole of the mm -hmm. tournament. It's dramatic, it's dark, it's kind of like cloudy, it's in Boston, people are chirping him the whole time. And he hits this amazing shot, it was incredible to watch on TV, but then to see it the first time on camera and to see the reaction of his family who was watching it with their mics on and to see how intense he was, but how stressed they were. And you could just feel all of the stress had been sort of put onto the family, like off of him, because he was there to do a job. And to, to watch it come to life, I mean, I still get chills thinking about it. And, and we saw it the first time and our amazing editor, had, you know, we had some, our composer had composed for that moment. And it was sort of like the end of a sports movie. It was just this big celebratory mm -hmm. track. And we were all kind of set back and we're like, God, it's not quite right. We gave like a really bunch of jumbled notes to the editor. We're like, we just wanted to feel like release, like this feeling of not like celebration, but actually just like you've worked your whole entire life every single day tirelessly to get to this moment. And it's finally happened. The feeling is like, oh, thank God, it's over, you know? And, and so the editor's like, I got you, right? So like 24 hours comes back, sends us a, a new cut of that scene. It's like, what do you think of this? And he put this Bon Iver song in there. And it was just perfect. Like just uh, everyone in the room, electric chills coursing through as you watch the scene in this perfect track and this perfect song. And you're like, the, the brilliance of like going to that track. And then we had to go get <laughs> the Bon Iver song. I wasn't really planning for it <laughs> after that moment. But you know, it just is amazing, the, you know, the creativity, the talent, like to, to take so much of for us, which was almost 750 hours of footage of originally shot footage and 6,000 hours of archive to turn that into six hours of television, you know, you got some damn good editors. Hmm. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I learned so much and I had such a pleasure watching all of your shows. I cannot wait to see the upcoming seasons of all of them and best of luck at the upcoming Emmy Awards as well. Have a great Thank day. Thank you very everyone. much. Thank yeah. you, Marcus. Yeah. Thanks, everybody.